the relationships had a plateau. You ever had that happen? I, I know you've had that happen. You're thinking of that right now. We've all had that happen. A relationship is just on fire. You enjoy being together. It's like you were siblings that somehow were separated at birth, but now have found each other and you can't get enough of each other. There's texting, there's phone calls, there's all kinds of stuff. You look forward to be together. There's uh, excuses to bump into each other. And then something happens, you know, it just kind of goes cold. I mean, it doesn't even go cold. Cold's fine, but it just goes lukewarm. What do you do? What do you do when the relationships hit that plateau? And again, they all do. Most small groups at some point or another have this happen. The group can really enjoy each other. And then it's not that they even annoy each other. They just aren't on fire anymore. And it's noticeable. How can you tell when a group is, uh, has uh, you know, sort of lost that first love? Well, people miss the group. Sometimes they don't even let you know they miss the group. Or if they miss the group, they miss the group for the lamest of reasons. Oh, I didn't have time to grocery shop this week. And this is the only time for the next two weeks to grocery shop. Sure. Yeah, I buy that. But it happens. So why does it happen? I think there's a few reasons we stop being curious about others. We do. I mean, we feel like, well, I've learned everything I can learn about that person. I've run out of questions to ask them. They've run out of questions to ask me, and maybe there's just nothing new to know about them. Or, or people plateau relationally because they decide how far they're going to go relationally. That is, I'm only going to be so transparent. I'm only going to be so honest. I'm only going to share so much of myself with you. I'm not necessarily going to share what I really think about this or that. Or I'm not going to let you know about this part of my life. Actually, this is why I think a lot of people don't want to host a small group. You go into somebody's home and you see what matters to them. You see what they spend money on or what they don't spend money on or how they spend time or how they keep house or how they don't keep house. And I don't think I would judge. I don't think I would judge any of my friends, but it's always a risk. You've never been in their house. You don't know how they keep house. And so they're not ready to be that kind of transparent with you, right? So um, we decide how far we're going to go relationally. Uh, the third reason that relationships plateau is potential conflict zones are avoided. We sure have learned that over the last couple of years as things have heated up politically. We hear words like polarization. I know I'm hesitant to talk about politics with people. I don't, I don't find that to be a comfortable subject. Some people find it very comfortable. I don't. And, uh, and I don't know if I shared my thoughts, what, what that would mean to people, if they would judge me for my opinions of things. Uh, uh, We've had it with the pandemic. There's people who are passionate about the vaccine and mass, and there's passionate people against both of those things. And then there's passionate people about forcing people to do things that they don't want to do. And there's passionate people against forcing people to do things they don't want to do. I mean, and the list goes on. And so most of us are a little bit gun shy about the conflict zones. And so we just avoid it. But the thing is, is in those more controversial subjects, there's deeper layers of relationship. Think about your most intimate connections. They know where you stand, don't they? That's, that's because they're in that intimate friendship circle with you. And so you're okay sharing that truly open moment with them. But if you're not willing to do that, that'll help a relationship plateau. And then finally connected to that one is we just don't feel safe. I'm just really concerned that if I shared what I really think about this, that, or the other thing, you judge me. You'd think I'm not a good Christian, or maybe you won't think I'm a Christian at all. Or maybe you won't think I'm a good person, or maybe you'll think I'm, a, I'm dumb or ignorant or a jerk or whatever, right? And so this is the world that we are living in right now. So what can we do about it? How do we move past the plateau? Well, let me get, give you some suggestions here. There's uh, six of these, actually, that I'll suggest to you. Uh, the first is don't avoid the awkward. Embrace it. Now, I wouldn't do this in a brand new group, okay? But if your group's been around for a couple years, you can probably deal with the awkward. You can probably talk about some things. I mean, you're going to have to figure out how to talk about those things, but embrace it. Move kind of into the mess a little bit. Again, you might have to coach people on how not to be a jerk and all of that, but 
but there you go. Number two, utilize good icebreakers. I, I can't say this enough, people. Uh, if you only own one book on small groups, buy a book of icebreakers. I mean it. Good icebreakers. Which, by the way, there's a lot of raunchy icebreakers out there, so be very careful. Not all icebreakers you find on Amazon are appropriate for groups, okay? So just be prepared. Probably shouldn't bring cards against humanity to your small group and call it an icebreaker. On the other hand, depending on your group, um, no, you probably shouldn't even then. See, I judged you. Did I make you feel unsafe? I hope that made you laugh. Okay, number three, encourage people to share what no one in the group would guess or know about them. So just share that. So that's its own kind of icebreaker, but uh, encourage it. You know, when you, when you get into these things, and you, it's amazing what sometimes comes out that people will share. But encourage people to share what no one in the group would guess or know about them. If, if they have an unusual hobby or a weird collection or any of that. Again, this kind of falls within the icebreaker, but here's where it's more than icebreaker. Like something you probably don't know about me. Not that you care, but um, I love work. I love building things with wood. And particularly reclaimed wood. I live near, a, I live in a housing development that's constantly being developed. And so I'll, I'll get scrap wood and I'll make things out of it. And some of it's not half bad, you know. I've never sold anything, but most people wouldn't know that about me, that uh, I have a, a pretty big tool collection in my garage and I live in a pretty nice warm part of the uh, the states at least most of the year so I can bring my tools out in the uh, driveway anyhow that's more than you wanted to know I'm sure right now you're like move on man move on all right number four talk about the forbidden subjects of politics sex and religion you're already talking about one of them you're already talking about faith so might as well go there with the other two again I'm not saying this for a brand new group. Remember, this is for a group that's plateaued. This is for a group that's been around for a while. You know, and maybe a little bit of uh, controversy and debate could stir things up in a good kind of way. Again, you're going to have to learn how to, how to talk about these things in a safe way, in a proper way, conduct yourself in a godly way in the way that you do it. But we sometimes think you're not supposed to talk about that. And uh, as I mentioned in the first session, this these, uh, these, this one in, the, in part one is built around uh, built around uh, Parker uh, uh, Priya Parker's uh, book, The Art of Gathering: How We Meet and Why It Matters. And so this is one of the things that she is a big fan of. She's like, by all means, lean into controversy. In my book, The Essential Guide for uh, Small Group Leaders. I have a bunch of tips in there and a handful of chapters on how to wade into those subjects, how to deal with conflict, how to talk about some of these things. So make use of that stuff. Uh, number five, connected to it, don't stop conflict, guide it. So if something controversial comes up, don't lean over and go, hey, 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 we don't talk about that in this group. No, instead say, oh, hey, let's, let's, let's be thoughtful about how we express our opinions, making sure that we we go after ideas, but let's not go after people. One of the topics that tends to come up in groups, I shouldn't say it tends to, but I, I, in my experience, it's come up a time or two, is politics. And people either want to talk about politics or they don't want to talk about politics. And so rather than say, hey, we don't talk about politics, I'd say up front with a brand new group, it's good. Hey, let's steer clear of politics till we are really comfortable with each other. But if you finally get there with your group and that helps move past the plateau, then guide it. Say, hey, um, the scriptures say that we aren't to bear false witness against others. And that's another way of saying we shouldn't slander others. And when you think about how much political discourse is nothing but slander, it's not built around fact. It's built around attack of the person, perceptions of a person, and then attacking the perceptions. So just right now, Think of who you consider some of the most political voices in politics, people who are in this political sphere. Maybe they are uh, pundits, but maybe they hold elected office. You picture that person right now. You know who they are. Picture the person you like the absolute least, that you just kind of, you see, you get hot under the collar for that person. According to the Bible, that person is made in God's image and Christ died for that person. 
That means they are of incredible value in Christ hopes they are redeemed, enjoying the family of God. 